when you're in the midst of running the business, I mean, you have to be obsessed with it. And maybe only in hindsight do I wish I made a few other decisions. I mean, there's things I changed along the way. I remember pulling out of my driveway on a Sunday afternoon and my three-year-old, you know, running down the driveway crying, don't leave, don't leave, right? You got a plane in an hour and a half, right? Mm. And so after that day, I never left on a Sunday. When all in, play my cards right. A BNT one blackjack all night. Roll the dice, let it ride. This podcast exists because of the team at CASCM. At CASCM, we make content creation enjoyable. We are on a mission to help leaders create content, content that will improve lives, content to be proud of, content that fosters community. We know through firsthand experience how content brings people together, and we love helping make that happen. We produce podcasts, short form videos, blog posts, and other written works, while also providing support in website development, social media management, and strategic planning. And we would be excited to help you. Visit cascm.com to learn more, or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. First thing I saw, Chris, when I was out there listening to your podcast, reading your websites about your book is you're over in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm here in Charlotte. We're both, I believe, from the Northeast. So I'm originally from Western New York, from Buffalo, New York. I believe, I know you spent a lot of time in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I believe maybe New Hampshire. So we got that connection right off the bat. What brought you down to the Raleigh, Durham and the Research Triangle? Well, it was almost getting on 20 years ago. I was 10 years in Chicago, and it took me 10 years to realize that as much as I love Chicago, it's freaking cold yeah. <laughs> a lot of months of the year. Yeah, yeah. So, Eric, it was almost totally weather-driven. Okay. But I also say, you know, it was 2005, and, you know, I'd been doing a lot of things. I've been an investor, a corporate venture fund, and, you know, without much exaggeration, in 2005, Chicago still did not know how to spell the word internet. Yeah. And we got to be in the place where we can get our jam going. And yeah. I just was having trouble getting my jam going. So I got I'm it. like, well, change the mojo. Yeah. So did you have, a, were you thinking at the time, because I'm thinking of cities, obviously San Francisco being the most obvious one at the time. Austin, Texas was probably still, still a little bit early perhaps, but you know, Raleigh with all the innovation they have going, had you thought about that or were you like, no, I'm staying on the East coast? I made a list. Yeah. Made a yeah. spreadsheet yeah. of things. <laughs> of course you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course I did. Yeah. <laughs> and it came down to two places, basically the kind of Chapel Hill of Raleigh Durham or Boulder, Colorado. Okay. And we had looked at Denver, Boulder numerous times. I've never been kind of like a New York, Boston, San Francisco, Atlanta, LA yeah. kind of person. I'm okay. I'd like to be more in the kind of that second tier. Sure. I'm from Philadelphia. My wife's from Rochester, New York. Oh, yeah. So we decided East Coast would probably be smarter right now Yeah, with parents aging and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's interesting that you say that because so often, especially at that time, and maybe even a little bit earlier, and I'm sure you saw this because I heard you talk about, well, when you're building a business in Lancaster, PA, it's hard to recruit talent to get there. But companies are everywhere, right? And you come to these, like you said, that's a smaller city, but you come to these secondary cities and it seemed like, oh, no, no, you need to be in San Francisco. You need to be in New York or Boston or what mm -hmm. have you. And here's someone who's, you know, you built businesses, you built many businesses and you don't see that. And I can see you nodding along with it. So, yeah, I mean, everyone needs to be where they feel the most comfortable. So I'm at no disparagement against those kind of places, but I like to get things done faster. And in that way, I like little smaller networks, smaller places. I can get to wherever I need to get to. So I've turned down the, the Silicon Valley gigs many, yeah. many times. Yeah. It's funny too, because so often I'll listen to podcasts or read a book about an entrepreneur or someone who's built something and you see all the, all the stuff they did with their business, but there's just so much more to the daily grind of what you're building and then you sell a business or you have all this stuff going on. People have a life, right? They have interests, they have intrigue, you know, that you live in a city and I like to hike, I like to do this. You like to play hockey. So it's funny because growing up in Buffalo, New York, I could look out my backyard, I could see Canada. So I didn't personally play hockey. I played street hockey. All my friends played hockey. A lot of them played in college. But you grow up in Buffalo, it's a way of life, right? You go to Sabres yeah. games at an early age. You know, I remember moving to Charlotte. And you're over in Raleigh. You'd understand this. In 06, the Sabres and the Hurricanes played in the Eastern Conference Finals. We show up there. <laughs> we're like taking over the stadium, lose game seven. It was like total heartbreak. And here's this new city and this new town. And it's grown, obviously, you just, you know, Stanley Cup this past year was the Vegas Knights versus the Florida Panthers, like, go figure. But anyway, hockey has this fascinating culture to it. My daughter, yeah. my youngest is playing hockey now, and we've been to Raleigh, we've been to Tampa, we've been to Orlando, and you see these places to where 
you would never imagine hockey would would go there, but you also see the camaraderie and like I said, this culture that's around this fascinating sport. Clearly, Canada and the Northeast has it. What's been your experience? Because from what I understand, I think you still playing hockey. You're still involved in the sport. Like that's obviously a big deal for you. It really is, and it goes back to my parents taking me to Philadelphia Flyers games yeah. when I was ten. Right, yeah. season tickets since 1970. You didn't walk to my parents' house without a sport on the TV. <laughs> I have two brothers. We're all two years apart. So, you know, all the things that brothers do. So hockey's our main gig. In fact, a funny little anecdote is that my parents have since passed. And when my last parent passed and I was happening to manage the estate, there was a little bit of chunk of money left over. And I said, instead of distributing this, guys, why don't we leave it in a pot? And every year we go to an away Flyers game. Oh, man. And so that's a cool thing we do. COVID kind of knocked us off two years sure by the way the best place i think we've been to is vegas to see yeah. the vegas nights i mean great fans and it's really fun to see as you know be in a different stadium than your team yeah some places it works out okay sometimes <laughs> right, it's right. a little tough <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah hockey is a big thing and it's funny eric because like obviously we're talking about entrepreneurship and i like to talk about entrepreneurship communities i feel like entrepreneurs are the same kind of tribe as hockey fans it's kind of like No one gets us. We're not the football. We're not the LA or the Silicon Valley. We're kind of the second tier. But you know what? We're really passionate and we're really tight. And, you know, the only thing better than seeing a Flyers fan is seeing another hockey fan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's one of those things. And sports in general, I think, can do this. And there's a lot of icebreakers, but sports is so easy. And if there's that commonality, whether it's a sport, whether it's a team, if I see you wearing a Flyers shirt and I'm a Sabres fan, we could talk about the fog game, right? There's all these (laughs) things that can come up in those conversations. And it's fun, right? It just, it's fun. And then when you see this next generation of hockey players that are coming up. These kids are talented. Yeah. I mean, my gosh, and the analytics that they have and the way they're going about the sport. It's I remember stories of Alex McGillney smoking cigarettes like in the locker room or right. It's a different era now. And it's fascinating. And we're seeing it all over. And it's a growth thing, right? It's almost like this entrepreneurial sport in a way. You talk about the yeah. culture and the growth of it in these towns. Like when we go to Raleigh or Tampa, when you go to cities that have that NHL team there, that there's a, even if you can't play for the Tampa Lightning, there's this aspiration that exists of like, ooh, that's why we read these books about Steve Jobs or whoever, right? And to, Phil Knight and to say, man, that's, that could be me. I could build something <laughs> at some level, right? And yeah, right. absolutely, absolutely. Well, it wakes me up every day. Yeah, you're still playing. I played up to COVID. Okay. And then the rinks closed down yeah. and... I'm actually closer to you now than I used to be. So I'm halfway between Charlotte and Raleigh okay. on a lake. And we've just been hanging out here Man. kind of post-COVID. Yeah. The nearest rink's an hour and 15 minutes yeah. away. So I'm itching. Yeah, yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if we talked a year from now that I was back yeah. finding a place to play, but we'll see what happens. You got the sticks in the garage, I bet. You're shooting around here. a little I bit. Did, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't get rid of the equipment, you know? You could still have fun. You could still have fun. I love it. Yeah. So, so you wrote a book and... It's funny. I hear this a lot about podcasting. Everyone has a podcast. Everyone has a book. It's not true, right? Like then you look at the numbers, it's just not true. Even if they did, it's still not a good reason to not do it because everyone has a car, everyone has a house, everyone's doing these things. And you you wrote a book. That's a big undertaking. It's funny. My father, who was in the dental business, he owned a dental practice for many years, sold out his business. And when he left, everyone was like, what are you going to do? He did all sorts of things. He played golf. He was day trading. He still had his real estate, right? He's doing all this stuff. And he was writing, writing, writing. It's like, why don't you write that book? Yeah. He wrote that book and it's become his career. It's become such a passion for him to write this book. And now he published his first book. He's writing a second book, but it's not some easy task. You just sit down and you're like, oh yeah, I just wrote a book. No, and everyone talks about it. It's like miserable at times and it's really difficult. And you're doing rewrites. At one point you think, oh no, the book's ready. It's like, no, no, no. You're going to start from the beginning and you're going to rewrite the entire book. So What was that experience for you with writing the book when you set out to do that whole project? Well, I'm probably on a similar path as your father. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because I was told in high school and in college that I couldn't write. I failed freshman (laughs) English in college because of writing, not because of the grammar tests. And I didn't really learn how to write till later. And my secret is I just write like I talk. So when people read the stuff that know me, it's like, it's like you're talking to me. Yeah. I don't know whether it's good or bad. It's just as my thing. But if you think about, you know, I've been an entrepreneur and then I was an investor and then I ran an accelerator and maybe I'm impacting one or five or seven companies. 
now I'm into like helping startup communities, which means I can help like hundreds of entrepreneurs in an area. And then you think about a book is I just trying to get my ideas out because I think I have a point of view that's interesting, right? Yeah. So I enjoy it very much so. And I got two or three other books lined up and I might even take a chance and write a piece of fiction. We'll see if I have the guts to do so. Yeah. I've uh, got a whiteboard with characters, right? Sitting that's over awesome. here. We'll see what happens. But for me, writing is is a little bit cathartic. It's like, I like the idea of organizing my thoughts. I love the idea. Like you said, you get to a certain point with the book, you're like, if I have to read this damn thing one more time, <laughs> right, right. I'm going to vomit, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm still in like book publishing slash marketing mode. Yeah. And I'm like, can I get rid of this and start, you know, when can I start writing again? Yeah. I heard that. that I just want to write. Yeah. I think my dad was going somewhere. He's like, can I just go write yeah. right now? I just want to write. And, and a lot of times it's allowing the author. And I've always thought this, like the creator, the artist, the podcaster, we work with a lot of people and we help build their podcasts. And what we try to do is allow them to have that conversation, create the narration, whatever that might be. Don't get lost in all these other pieces. Your talent is in this. And it's a lot of times in entrepreneurship, right? Like this is your role. Do that. Don't get too lost over here because next thing you know, you're spread too thin and it's really difficult. Yeah. So this is my second book. The first one was almost totally, I kind of did a hybrid publishing with a good friend who's a longtime book agent. And we put that together. This time I said, I'm going to hand this off. Yeah. I want the production, someone else to handle production. Yeah. And it's a better book because of it. Yeah. It's worth the investment. Yeah. I think so. I'll let you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Well, we talk about nowadays, right? You can learn about from Seth Godin, James Altucher, and there's opportunities that anyone can write a book now. That's where the whole concept of, you know, I think about college. One of my kids was applying to college and you know, if the test scores, you have the common app and you could just send it. And so college applications have gone through the roof because you could just send it out. And, you know, you got to do, there's like obviously small parts that you still have to add to each college most of the time, but it's become an easier process, which I think is a yeah. good thing, right? To get featured, to do press release, right? To get on the local TV show took like an act of Congress. Nowadays, you could show up, which I've seen you done, and you're on all these different podcasts. And so writing a book becomes much easier because you can publish it. You don't need Penguin Random House nope. to distribute your book. And you have Scribe Media, who's done incredible things. And Tucker Max had built it, it or one of the people that had built it. And a lot of people now are able to publish a book that otherwise wouldn't have been able to. And I think that, yeah. I, like I said before, I think that's a good thing. I think it's a very good thing. Well, I think everyone is an expert in something and they should share that expertise. Yeah. And by the way, we all know today that you have to kind of market yourselves to some limit yeah. or some extent or whatever. And so writing a book is my way of doing that. I yeah. also do some blogging and some speaking, but I like that. So, you know, yeah. if you like it, do it, right? Why not? And I would imagine you've built up the audacity to put yourself out there. And I guess writing a book's maybe a little bit different. Being on a podcast for the first few times is a little bit different. Did you have that? We're like, oh gosh, like, what are people going to say about this? Is my writing terrible? Is this, or were you just like, I don't really care. I'm putting it out there and I know what I know and I'm, see what happens. Yeah, probably a little bit of both. Yeah. You know, I do care, but it's amazing that once you get the first kind of 10, 5, 15 people to read like a sample, I have a business partner in the uh, technology accelerator that we ran together, you know, for four or five years. And he's an extremely bright guy and he's got a Stanford MBA and a law degree from UNC. And when I give it to him and he goes, this is good. Yeah. I'm like, God. Yeah. Yeah. You still have <laughs> that. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Keeps you on your toes, yeah. that type of thing. Well, it keeps you on your toes. But, you know, let's face it, we all have doubts about certain things about yep. ourselves. So, you know, it's good that you get outside yeah. validation. It's one of the number one things is why I've seen people not create, whether they don't start a business, whether they don't create their podcast, whether they don't write a blog or a book or something like that. And it's totally understandable. It takes a lot and you don't know what's going to be said. And you said before, I think everyone's an expert, everyone has a story. And you don't know what that story is. And I guarantee you, I always sit back and like, go read your emails. Go think yeah. back to the conversations you just had. You know something that people would be interested in learning. And maybe it's a family member. I've heard that from, we talked to a former army combat veteran, Black Hawk pilot, and his mom, he wrote a book and his mom thanked him. I didn't know you went through all this. I didn't yeah. know these stories. Yeah. She was in her 90s at this point. And that there, I mean, he was like, choked up just talking. His father had passed away when he was in his early 20s. And to hear that story, it's like, that's why you create. 
Yeah. And it might be just your family member, but it also might be someone on the other side of the world, or the other side of the country, or next door to you, or in the same state. And so I think it takes time to build up that, oh, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to do it because it is tough. It's yeah. very tough to put yourself out there. Well, I'll tell you another little story in that my father medically retired at 40 years old. They gave him eight years to live. He lived 38 years. Mm. He probably read four or five books a week, every week for those wow. 38 years. Wow. And so a little sad note is that he never got the chance to read the two books I've written so far. Yeah. But yeah. maybe I'm kind of writing a little bit for him too. You know, yeah. look, dad, I could be one of your guys. So yeah, yeah. share your damn stories. Yeah. And by the way, implied in that is a little bit of the fear thing. What are people going to think? Or can I really do it? And to your point about it's mechanically easy to do it. So fuck it. Like, go do it. And if the only people that read it are your 10 people in your family, you know, go to Lulu, which is a great little book publishing path. You know, create 10 books, send them to your family and say, I'm done. Right. Like, yeah. why not? Tell your story. Yeah. I love that. You had said it on a podcast and someone had asked you, and I'll put the link to that episode. What's the last advice you would give or take more risks? You said, take more yeah. chances. The downside is just not that bad. And you said it there in a different way. And that's so it. That is so it. And I appreciate hearing it because we all need to hear it sometimes because sometimes we get concerned that we're going to go down this path. Oh man, that's a big chance I'm about to take. And you're here to say, no, 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 go for it. You know, sometimes there's these like bucket list things and people can overdo those things. And I'm really not a big bucket list person, but there's been a number of things that I kind of said, you know, I'd really want to do that someday. Yeah. And I've kept them in my head and I'm just about done the first five, right? Wrote a book, now at two books, jumped out of an airplane last October, <laughs> afraid of heights. Yeah. No reason to do that again, but I can say that I <laughs> did, did that. Yeah. Uh, did it, by the way, just south of Charlotte in South Carolina. Oh, very cool. One day I wanted to do stand-up comedy in front of an audience. I did it in front of the 300 staff, my staff peers at Techstars at our annual meeting one year. Yeah. So like we all have those things in our head, just decide to go do them. And I don't know, life's richer and fuller because of it. Yeah. So I would imagine then you appearing on these podcasts of which you've been on a lot. You're on the little bit of media tour, book tour, that kind of thing. Do you enjoy it? I mean, obviously you understand the value in marketing and putting yourself out there and it's a different age than it was possibly when you were working on MapQuest and other businesses that you've done to say, wow, man, I'm just talking to people that I otherwise would never have met. And I don't know how you feel about that experience, but podcasting is obviously something that you want to do. How has that worked out? Yeah, well, I'm going to get squishy for a second. And I say to people all the time that I believe life is about these meaningful connections that you make. and First, you got to get connected to people and then you kind of make them meaningful. And we're having a really fantastic conversation. I didn't know you were in Charlotte. You're an hour away. I can kind of see you from my right, office. Right. But like, you never know what the serendipity of how two people connect and what that's going to mean. And so like, I get to talk about how I think. I get to talk about great experiences. And if one person listens out there and says, you know what, I am going to go write that darn book. I feel like that's a really cool thing. I have no fear in talking to people, meeting people and diving in. So here we are. Now besties, right? Yeah, that's right. I'm with you on that. How do you feel being in the business that you've been in and all the different things that you've done and talking to different entrepreneurs, the word ROI or the letters ROI, return on investment come up quite a bit. And with marketing, it's very confusing, right? I've always heard the story of when someone shows up to the Mercedes Benz dealership and why were they there that day? Did they see in the Entrepreneur Magazine on page 18 that there's the Benz that they wanted? I tend to think it's all a culmination of many things, many factors that played a role in getting them to show up. And if you asked them on that day when they're in this showroom, why are they there? I don't know if they could truly give you that answer. Mm -hmm. But when you think of marketing, when you think of podcasting and all these things, like what's your ROI on being in this room with me today and talking about the things that we're talking about or what's the ROI in podcasting? How do you do it for business? Like when you hear that, and answer that any way you want. Like, I'm not saying I have the answer for it. I'm just interested in what you're thinking about it when it comes to ROI, marketing, podcasting, writing a book, all of that. Yeah, so my ROI is not money. And maybe it's because I've been lucky in the success I've had previously. My ROI is, can I impact a thousand entrepreneurs a year? That's my little artificial goal. And to do that, I'm also a huge Seth Godin fan, so I believe in the long tail. Right. Yeah. And so I send out a, a weekly email of my thoughts. It goes to about 8,300 people, average about a thousand people per email, kind of open it up and click to the link to read more. 
what's that say, right? Find a thousand passionate people. So I'm like, it's working, right? Yeah. If that goes up, that's just a gift. So that's my goal is how do I impact a thousand entrepreneurs, whether that's doing a podcast, whether that's speaking, whether that's doing, I still have open office hours. You can go to my website, you can schedule. I'll do a 20 minute one-on-one with anybody. Yeah. It's your 20 minutes. So that's my ROI. Got it. How do you talk to other entrepreneurs about that? If you're influencing them and then you're having one-on-ones and you're having other people that either you're investing in them or whatever it is that you're doing. And they are, let's say, the revenue driven, right? For obvious reasons, they're building a business. They want to sell the business down the road and they're thinking about it. Not everything's an ROI as far as money is concerned. Again, I guess it'd be difficult to answer. I understand it. So take it any direction you want because it depends on the business. It depends on that individual. But when you're talking to other people about these things and getting yourself out there and networking or what have you, like how do you think through that or use an anecdotal case if you want? Yeah, I mean, I think it's actually pretty simple. Your return on investment is what is your primary goal, right? Like you shouldn't have 14 goals. You should have one. If driving revenue, driving profits or growing your business, however you want to define that, is your primary goal, great. Then let's make sure all your actions and activities are oriented around that. There's a phrase, you know, we've used in the past. Shoot, of course, I'm blanking on it. But the idea of vanity metrics, yeah, right? And so are we really kind of looking at the return, looking at that calculation the right way? I'm a big fan of like simplifying and going to the focus. That's the whole build the fort metaphor that is part of every book I write, right? It's this idea of think like more like your 10 year old when things were simpler, get rid of all the noise, all the vanity metrics, all the shit that doesn't matter. And so whatever it is, if you can articulate that and you say, this is what my goal is, great. Maybe I can help you be a third party, look at you from afar or within and say, well, does that thing really kind of support that or not? And I think that's, you know, one way. And so it doesn't matter what it is, as long as you understand it and you're orienting most of your life around that. Yeah. The entrepreneur thing's interesting because there's this way of, you build your own schedule at that point, right? You start your own business, you have your own time. It's like I talked about before. My daughter and I, yesterday, my wife and I went out, but my daughter and I this morning went for a run, went for a walk around the lake, the whole thing. And I got to do that because I didn't have to call in anybody to say, hey, I won't be there until this time. And I love that. That's a very, very important to me to be able to do what I want to do on that day. That doesn't mean like it works both sides. Say, well, now all of a sudden tax time comes, this comes, like you're responsible for it. So when you're an entrepreneur, it's your time, but like it's also you lose time. So I guess what I'm getting at, you're building your business, you're at MapQuest, you're doing all the things that you're doing, and you're also building a family at the same time. How did you think through all of these things Mm -hmm. and how did you deal with that, knowing that it might pull you away? And I don't, you can tell me what that experience was like or, or was it, no, 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 I went to my kids' plays. I was at their sporting events. If I wanted to go for a walk with my daughter or my wife, that's what we did. How do you think through that? How did you think through that? Well, I have some regrets, to be honest with you. When you're in the midst of running the business, I mean, you have to be obsessed with it and maybe only in hindsight do I wish I made a few other decisions. I mean, there's things I changed along the way. I remember pulling out of my driveway on a Sunday afternoon and my three-year-old, you know, running down the driveway crying, don't leave, don't leave, right? You got a plane in an hour and a half, right? Mm. And so after that day, I never left on a Sunday. Mm. No weekends, right? Like I have to adjust that. I had a very, very, very supportive, I have, still have a very supportive wife. But at the time, you know, there's a few times you're living in Chicago, you fly to San Francisco, you hit the ground running on Monday, you got meetings, three days looking at investments, you're having dinners, you're running really hard, and, you know, you get home Friday afternoon and like all you want to do is sleep all day Saturday and it's like your kids need you, right? Yeah. So a uh, really smart Brad Feld, a good partner of mine in various things, coined the term, which I love and have borrowed and made big in my world, which is work-life harmony as opposed to work-life balance. Work-life balance implies some 50, 50, 60, 40. I think harmony is the right word. And the way that he explains it, or the way that I interpret his explanation is that, you know, there's times when you have to be all in on your business. And there's times when you have to actually be all in on your family. And it's not like you got to do this calculation, but there's times when you got to recognize that both are important and figure out what the harmony is. And Sometimes one is 60-40 and then it's 40-60 or 30-70, I don't know, Sure, whatever it is. 
you know, I'm trying to make up for it in the last 10 years now that I've kind of slowed down and I get to pick my schedule. I don't, I haven't set an alarm for probably 10 years now. And, you know, I get to make sure I'm healthy and I'm present, you know, with my kids and things. And I'm now able to invest in some of their activities and yeah. whether it's watching the grandkids for a couple of days while they sneak away or whether it's helping my son open a skateboard shop in Chapel Hill, which is pretty cool. Very cool. Um, trying to make up for maybe a few of those things that I might've missed. Yeah. It's an important topic. I think a lot of people are asking it. I think you mentioned COVID a couple of times. I think a lot of people brought back some awareness. They had a lot of reflection time. And I think that's what you had when you tell that story. I mean, I picture your daughter where you were, and but I've heard these stories before. And there's an awareness factor to say, hmm, I'm not doing that again. Yeah. That's it. And then you have, maybe you have to go through that, that type of thing. We do have choices, yeah. right? I mean, a lot of times, like, I don't have any choice. Well, you do have a choice, right? You do yeah. have a choice of when you set up the meeting. I'm not doing meetings on Monday morning in San Francisco. <laughs> so, right, right. Sorry. Absolutely, absolutely. You come out with MapQuest, and I know you had, at some point, I think you had left before MapQuest had went public. And I do remember, you again, you had talked about on an episode, the trip ticks with AAA. And I remember yeah. driving from Buffalo, New York, where I went to school down to Charleston, South Carolina, and it's, you know, 12, 15 hours, whatever it is, you're flipping through this whole thing, like, this is crazy, but that's what we knew, right? And so it was like, that's yep. what you do, and this is great, and thank goodness you had that, because who knows where you would have ended up if you didn't have that. You got to go down Route 19, and this is how you do that, so all, it's all good, and and then MapQuest comes around, and now here we are, modern day, with Waze and Google Maps, and, you know, pick your Apple Maps and all that. So you're building this thing out, and what I found fascinating, though, in all of that is you had these two unique distinct talents that you went after. And I'll let you talk about it, what you majored in in college. And it's this, have you probably heard the Scott Adams talent stacking, where you take these two very uncommon things, you put them together and you become such a unique person in doing that. And, you know, I think you can have multiple talent stacks that apply to different things. One of the things that I found interesting is we have an insurance brokerage business. We work in the financial services industry. And so if I take financial services industry, pair that with podcasting, well, we become probably, as far as I know, the only company that works with financial service companies that does podcasting for them. So we know what it's like to have a series 24 principle, how to talk to a compliance officer, how to spell insurance and make sure that whatever they're saying on their podcast isn't going to get them in trouble with the SEC. And so the talent stacking is a big deal, but talk about that because that was like really the beginning of MapQuest, if I understand it correctly, that you paired these two uncommon things together. And it was like, oh, wow, Chris has got this thing. And you realize <laughs> you had this thing. Yeah. Well, I, you know, what you're referring to is I was or am a geography graduate. I have an undergraduate and a graduate degree in geography. I remember the look in my dad's face. <laughs> You know, I said, I'm going to be a geographer. And he's like, oh, shit. <laughs> and his brother was a geographer. So that's where I probably got a little inspired. Sure. And he said, you should go into computers, son. It's right. kind of like plastics, right? If you know back to the graduate reference, you know, plastics is yeah. son is the future. <laughs> you know, like a lot of us, I was very lucky to take a class that just blew my head apart in a good way. And it was a computer mapping class. Now, for reference to everyone listening, computer at that time, this is probably 1979 or 80. Computer meant big mainframe computer, a printer device, which was you know where you wrote things in on. But somehow it turned me on. And with a really great professor who said, well, then you should take some computer science credits. And I took about, I can't remember, 12, 15 hours of computer science graduate credits as an undergraduate. And to the fact that I always took from the same professor and he'd always like, Raise your hand if you're not a computer science major, knowing I was the only one, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I learned how to write code. I learned how to write code in the early 80s and still as a geography major, not a very good geographer, not a super great computer science person. But to your point, jam those two things together when it was just taking off. We call it GIS today. We didn't call it GIS back then. And I just found it so intriguing, so interesting to kind of figure stuff out. Sounds like an entrepreneur, doesn't it? Sure. This blank sheet of paper called computer mapping that I just went all in. And I was self-motivated, right? No one had to motivate. Like, I hope everyone finds something like that in their life Yeah. where you just can't get enough, right? And so that was a journey that lasted me a good 15 to 20 years. Yeah. Well, you're encouraging people to do that by taking chances, by finding these things, by giving, hey, here's my story and here's what it worked. It's You probably could care less about geography, someone else, but you have these two interests, put those together and who knows what yeah. can happen. Yeah. 
Curiosity, right, is a word that mm. a lot of times we use, and I think it's an extremely powerful word. I think we're all curious about some things, but most people sit or many people sit and watch that thing as opposed to going, I'm going to kind of dive in. I want to know a little bit more about generative AI or whatever it is, right? Yeah. A while ago, my son, this is my son at this time, was playing in this basketball league called Yes, I Can Basketball. They just had a Father's Day tournament this past weekend, and it was awesome. We had tons of fun. I was there with my daughter. And they told the story, the team had lost and they're young. I think they're like eight or nine years old. And some kids are upset. They're going to get over it like really fast. But they give this presentation after. And I likened this thing to entrepreneurship because I was starting my business at this time. And he told, he's like, I know you all, a lot of you are upset. He's like, I just want to tell you, there's three things that happen in sports. There's winning, there's losing, and then there's not participating. A lot of you just lost today and you're upset and that's okay. The best thing you could have is winning. But you know what? At least you played. At least you, you're not sitting on the sidelines. You are participating. And I think that was like, that hit me right then. I wrote an article about it. I remember it was fascinating because the founder <laughs> of the company... I'm writing it down. I love this. Yeah, he had found the article online and reached out and was just like, what is this? Like, what's going on? We ended up doing a podcast conversation together and had just an incredible conversation. And we formed, you know, a connection. My son actually just interned with them recently while he was in high school. But that was all him. But it was like the point of that's it. And that's how I game. felt. Get in the game. Get in the game. Yeah. Write the book, write the blog post, start a thing. Yeah. Whatever. Get in the game. Yeah. Man, it's good. The last thing I asked you before we get into like where the people find you in your book is you get to this point, you have a big buyout, you sell your business, maybe you get an exit strategy, something, you win the Stanley Cup championship. And we had a podcast that we work with and this young woman, she was at Northwestern University and she was talking to, at the time, the two-time college softball national champion, Jada Coleman, plays for the Oklahoma Sooners. Well, sure enough, a few weeks after the podcast, she wins it for the third time in a row. But after she had won it, she goes back to her hotel room. She looks and she's like, so what? What now? Like, I just won. And that's a lot. And you hear this about a lot of people who have built their business and their whole life was building this thing or going for this championship. And then they do it. They get to the mountaintop. They get to the peak. And it's like, and you've heard horror stories of people committing suicide about this thing. This is a real mm -hmm. thing that's out there. And you talking to entrepreneurs, you had a day where you left your company and again, you know, selling the business, what have you, whatever aspect that is of your mountaintop, of your peak, how was it for you? And then how have you seen it for other entrepreneurs as they've gone through maybe similar journeys of their own? Yeah, for me, I'm just always curious about something else. I mean, my move out of MapQuest was going to run a corporate venture fund from MapQuest's largest investor. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I don't know anything about venture capital. Obviously, we took some to build MapQuest, but what's it like to be on the other side of the money? That sounds kind of interesting. I'm going to go try that for a while. After I did that, I couldn't stand most venture capitalists because they didn't know their ass from a hole in the ground. Right. Uh, I was tired of sitting in board meetings when they were like, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, yeah. you know, operationally, you should do this. I'm like, have you ever done that? Yeah. Anyway, so then I was like, you know what? I really like the operations. I went, So then I went and I would be the guy that a VC parachuted in to get an unstuck company unstuck or a stuck company unstuck. I've always, in that curious place, I've just... Not like a shark in a bad way. Like I say, a shark always has to keep moving. And in fact, my wife and I just talked about this. When are you going to retire? I'm like, I am retired. Right. But I'm still moving. Right. I'm still doing things. You know, I'm writing books. I'm helping our son with a shop. You know, I got, you know, a little project down in Columbia, South Carolina, where I went to grad school. That's two hours away. So, yeah, I don't know. I think I tell people to just keep moving, keep doing yeah. things. To your point, like not participating is not an option. I don't have to go win something. I just have to, I want to play in the game. Do I expect to sell a million copies of this book? No. Would I like to see a lot of copies? Yeah, whatever a lot is, but then there'll be the next one. And then the other thing is like the monetary thing is a really weird kind of dynamic. And I think sometimes people do get too caught up in what that means. I live a very normal lifestyle. My kids are like normal, like, <laughs> We didn't get on private jets to go places. It was never going to happen. It's not the way I grew up, not the way my parents raised me in our environment where my dad got sick, right? And so I just, you know, lead a normal life. And no one, like the old, member, the millionaire next door kind of book? Like, yeah. you know, you can do whatever you want. The money obviously gives you some freedom to decide what you want to do, but it's not the only dimension that you should be judging yourself on and yeah, whatever. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, stay curious, stay interested. That was another one. 
Steve Lavin, he was a basketball coach for UCLA and we had him on the podcast and he tells stories about John Wood and these fascinating stories about how John Wooden was always staying interested. He's 99 years old, shows up at his house and there's John Wooden and he's got books laid out. He's like, coach, what do you got going on here? And he's like living in his apartment. He's like, he's learning about world religions. He's learning like, why did certain things happen? This guy's late nineties doing all this stuff. And he's just like, man, that just teaches him so much. And then he's working with Brett Musburger and Brent Musburger thought he had something interesting going for him. And he says to Steve Lavin, he's like, stay interested, kid. Stay interested. And you're like, yeah. man, it's just what you're saying. And Chris, I got to say, like, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs. I talk to a lot of people. I read a lot of books. I listen to podcasts. I do all this stuff. And, and sometimes you can resonate with certain people and entrepreneurs and how they think about it. It's like, man, I could take a lot from all that you said. I can picture myself listening to this conversation. I mean, like I've always said is... If this conversation just plays itself for me in the future, selfishly, I'm here for it. And if my kids in their own time get to listen to it, that's my return. And that's what I'm here for. So thank you. Yeah, well said. Oh, well, my pleasure. We just built a meaningful connection. And so my day's good. Yeah. <laughs> Build the fort. You got the book out. I'm excited to read it. I've learned about it a little bit more, but I know we can buy it on Amazon. Is that where you want people to go to buy this book? And who's the book for? Yeah, so there's... I threw a little confusion into the world that I have to go fix. It's good. First book called Build a Fort, How to Start Anything. Six years ago, available on Amazon, easy to find. Really just about starting anything. This book's called Build a Fort, The Startup Community Builder's Field Guide. This is for people who are trying in Charlotte to be involved or Knoxville or Tallahassee or Berlin or Taipei, Taiwan, places I've actually worked in saying, how do I be an entrepreneur, investor, a community builder? How do I help my community foster more entrepreneurship? That's what this one's about. They're both available on Amazon. Uh, just look up Build the Fort and Chris Hively and you should find them and let you know at Hively.com, H-E-I-V-L-Y. You want to talk? You want 20 minutes? We'll talk about anything you want to talk about. I've only had one person try to sell me something, life insurance. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> I turned that conversation around. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just amazing who you meet. They come from all over the world. I don't know how they find me sometimes because they saw me speak or, you know, listen to a podcast. But yeah, let's build meaningful connections. And that's how you can find me. That's good stuff, Chris, man. I've enjoyed this so much. Thank you so much for your time. Let's hopefully we get to stay in touch. I'll let you know when this is all going out live. And thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thanks, Eric. In case you haven't noticed, we love podcasts. In fact, we love building podcasts, everything from development to production. Because of all that, we're building a one-of-a-kind podcast network. If you have a podcast or looking to launch a new podcast, then we should talk. You can message me on Twitter at Eric underscore Kaz or hit us up any way that works for you. Let's talk about your podcast joining this one-of-a-kind podcast network.